So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for this Q&A following the film 9 to 5, The Story of a Movement. My name is Joanne Parson. I'm the Director of Education for the California Film Institute and the Mill Valley Film Festival and it is my great pleasure to welcome our special guests, uh, co-directors Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar and our special guest Mary Jung, one of the av av activists and um, special uh, people in the film that you were going to, I'm sure you've seen. Um, thrilled to have you with us, Mary, as well. Um, I think, Mary, you're joining us from... The, from San Francisco, correct? Uh, I am. Yes, fantastic. And Julie and Stephen, you are in Ohio. We are in Yellow Springs, Ohio right now. Okay, wonderful, the home of Antioch College. Um, right. Yes, wonderful to see you both. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your amazing film. I'm so glad we were able to include it in the festival. Uh, so timely on so many levels, and we can talk a little bit about that, of course. Um, but first, I just I want to congratulate you both on your, I mean, it really has not been that long since you just won your last Academy Award for Best Documentary for American Factory, that was still this year. Um, and I'm, you know, documentary feature films are not really known for being quick to produce. So I'm, I'm wondering how you managed to do both of those in such a short period of time. Well, the truth is um, we started to make the, what turned out to be nine to five, the story of a movement, at least three to four years before American Factory was even a, an idea or a glimmer or anything. And then we worked on it slowly as we were making American Factory, which took four years. Uh, and then we went back to it and finished it uh, and got it out within a year. But American Factory um, was like a tornado that kind of flew through our lives. Uh, you know, it's a cinema verite film, so you're following action every day. Whereas this one, which is fun to talk about, is, a, is an oral history film, Nine to Five, The Story of a Movement. And that you do, you can do much more methodically and slowly. In fact, you really have to because you're unearthing history. I mean, there's no book about nine to five. There wasn't at that point. There was very little written about it. It was really a movement that was kind of very impactful in ways I'm sure we'll talk about, but um, kind of lost to history. So what you have to do as a filmmaker is find the people you know, find the archival footage, find the stills. And that's a really, really interesting process. I will say Mary Jung, who's right here, was one of the people we like discovered. Nobody knew what had happened to Mary Jung. Everybody remember her. She's in a lot of pictures. If you look in the film, there's a lot of photographs of Mary. There's even a little footage we managed to find of Mary as a 20 something, I imagine, right? And, but nobody knew where she was. Well, in Ohio, of course, Mary's was very well known in California and well, San Francisco. Well, yeah, but in Ohio. But, uh, in Ohio, where she had been a nine to five activist, a pioneering young activist in Cleveland, you know, they were all wondering where, where had she gone? And then somehow we like, maybe she's went out West and maybe San Francisco. And of course, then we found out she was the chair of the Democratic Party of San Francisco. Of and it was in fact the same Mary Jump. Right, Mary? That's how, and then we picked up the phone and called you. It was so much fun to, to get that phone call and to be reconnected to the past. I mean, these are women who, um, who, who mentored me. And you know, all my life, you know, my success is due to the strong women who've mentored me um, throughout my life, you know, from my mother to my sister, um, to w people like Karen Nussbaum, Helen Williams. You know, these women gave me direction and they saved my life. And so to be able to reconnect with them um, you know, because of Julia and this wonderful documentary uh, was the greatest gift of all. And I can't thank you enough. Well, so Mary, what has you been doing? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, Mary, what, uh, what was your trajectory from the 9 to 5 movement in Cleveland that got you to San Francisco and to that role in the Democratic Party? What was your trajectory along those many years? So um, I've always been interested in politics. When I was 18, I was getting ready to go to college. My my bus was late at my transfer stop. And I happened to be in front of the George McGovern for our president headquarters. And I was just like twiddling my thumbs, just waiting for the bus and talking to the volunteers, talking to the staff. And at some point I just realized this is just so much more interesting than what I'm about to do. Um, college can be put off for, for a few months and I'll go volunteer in this campaign instead. You know, right then, everyone was talking about the Vietnam War, stopping that. Um, universal health care was finally on a, the Democratic Party platform, which I was very passionate about. 
And so it just seemed like much, a much better thing to do. And so from slow volunteerism, um, I ended up being an activist um, at Cleveland Women Working, you know, part of the nine to five movement. And then at one point, you know, I did the very traditional thing that my mother wanted me to do, which was um, get married and have children, right? And so I ended up moving out to California. And um, well, I mean, once an activist, you're always an activist, right? And I just couldn't stay still for very long. And so I ended up volunteering out in California. And the first campaign I worked on was um, in 1995 for um, then Assembly Speaker Willie Brown, who then eventually became the mayor. And then that just started me in Democratic Party, party politics in San Francisco. And eventually the chair of the party. And, you know, we're still working, you know, buttons off right now. I mean, San Francisco, um, and, you know, I'm sure all the people out in Mill Valley know this because you're all part of the same group, California group where we all, because California is blue, we do a ton of work out in the um, northeastern states, all the way, you know, going to Hawaii. So, you know, election week, we start at seven in the morning to hit the East Coast voters, and we're still going after eight o'clock at night over here because we're hitting Hawaii. And that's it's just the type of activism California is about, and so, especially San Francisco. Wow. I know that personally, I'm thrilled that you're part of that whole machine for sure. So thank you um, for all of your work. Um, so, so you mentioned the accident. That's what's so cool is she yeah. missed the bus or <laughs> played and, you know, but I think the women, I think the spirit of the women in nine to five must have really captured you back in Cleveland. Even, you know, Cleveland, Ohio was kind of a hotbed for nine to five, right? That's where Jane Fonda. <laughs> Right? Did you, were you there when Jane Fonda came? Oh by? yeah, it was amazing. Got the idea she, for the movie. It, it was, um, it was, it was like the experience of a lifetime for a lot of our members. I mean, a lot of our members are just, um, I shouldn't say just, but average everyday working women, um, secretaries, bank tellers, um, file clerks. You know, when people used to file by paper, and to be able to meet a bona fide movie star was um, the biggest thrill of their lifetime. And, you know, we thought that they would be really shy and quiet, but they couldn't wait to tell Jane their stories and what they were thinking about their bosses. It was so funny. I know that, you know, some people were mortified. Oh my God, these nice, quiet, respectable women are saying these things about their bosses. But um, it was, op it was eye-opening. It was great. And how did Jane first, like, how did she recognize that this was something because you know Jane's been involved in the, had been involved in a lot of different you know activist movements and I'm just wondering what the, kind of the trigger was and particularly how it got her to to, send to Cleveland you know oh, well I let, let me I think she's told me about it um Jane and Karen knew each other from the anti-war movement uh the Indochina peace campaign in fact they both together Jane and Tom came through Dayton Tom Hayden Tom Hayden, who was 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 going to be her husband, he wasn't yet. Although we had our suspicions, the people whose house she they stayed in, we thought, hmm, we have a feeling they're a couple now, but we weren't sure. Uh, anyway, we went to the Ohio State Fair, you know, together. So Taryn was also, you know, an activist in the anti-war movement, and they became friends. And I guess which makes sense, they're both really really smart, able women. And they kind of stayed in touch over the years. And uh, Karen started talking to Jane about what she was doing, right? Mary, she started on the phone saying, mm -hmm. you know, you want to come out here and see what's going on. And um, eventually Jane got the idea through, through observing and learning from Karen what 9 to 5 was all about. It's about nine years after, after the organization, the movement got started that the movie came out. It's, you know, and of course people know the movie, you know, you ask everyone, even if they're 25 years old, have you ever seen the movie nine to five? Do you know the song? Of course, people can sing the song, but they don't realize that the song and the movie were based on a movement that had been around for years. Um, and so anyway, it's, one one of the things I love is that Jane, you know, Jane told us when we were lucky to interview her that originally the film was going to be a drama. She was going yes. to do a drama Serious. about secretaries uh, fighting for their rights, kind of like she had done with other sort of social political mm -hmm. fiction films in the seventies. She did so many of those great ones, but 
they realize, as, as Verna and, and Karen say in the film, as you saw, uh, that satire was going to skewer the issue much more sharply and that humor has a place in a, in a political film. Humor can be more effective than drama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely worked in that film. I mean, I have very fond memories of, of what that film was just hilarious. Very well done. And a lot of it, though, has to do with those three actresses, too, and that, you know, that the dynamic between them and how different they are. Like, the casting of that also was sort of brilliant in that respect. But there, and the ideas about the boss, will, will people have already seen the film when they see this? Yeah, this is... Oh, so it'll be afterwards. So now you know that all the, many of those ideas, and people said, yeah, I want to kill my boss. <laughs> just, which shocked people, you know. That. <laughs> Yeah, I would say, actually, I think one of my favorite lines in the film is, is sometimes a bad boss is the best organizer. <laughs> yes, and that's still true. Yeah, well, I was wondering if actually, if you feel that might be especially true since the Me Too movement. I feel like that that's probably driven that even more. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, as a filmmaker, you always think, well, I hope my film will be relevant because, you know, it takes a few couple years uh, to make a film. And... With this one, we, you know, when we started the film, there was no Me Too movement. There was nothing like that. In fact, if anything, feminism was kind of on the back burner. There was right. a lot of anti-feminism, even of the new generations. People would say, I'm not a feminist. Um, and then, you know, so eight years go by as we make the film, and then Me Too happens. You know, the new president's elected. Uh, pink hats are all over the place. And then... Our film comes out and it's, it's like after eight years it came at the perfect time <laughs> it was oh, on yeah. purpose i'm not sure i answered your question though but yeah it was on purpose yeah maybe i don't remember what my question was i think that was perfectly re uh, reliable answer um and, well and it's interesting too that's how it shifted from also from uh, in addition to the me too movement from the clerical workers to food workers and child care workers and like it it the, it's it's always relevant to some demographic of our professional you know society it seems like there's always someone who's kind of at you know at the bottom who's being treated horribly and you know that there that, that there's definitely like i feel like there's so much here to demonstrate how successful that was um for those movements that are sort of just getting started i mean certainly with restaurant workers there's a lot going on um and i'm wondering if you're seeing a lot around that oh and you know it's still mostly women as it was then right low-paid folks were mostly women and now they're mostly women and people of color. And they're starting to really, they've been, right, Mary? Step up on their own behalf. People are starting to get that voice like you guys did. I think, I don't know what you think, Mary. I think, because you're still an activist, um, I think there are things in the film, we designed it this way, actually, we hope, to be like lessons for today. Oh, definitely. I mean, making it, but now we, yeah. The things that um, I learned as an organizer, I, I mean, I learned, so um, this is like back in the early and mid 70s, and well, actually most of the 70s for me, right? Um, you know, when I think of uh, the things that I learned on organizing and how to relate to people and how to organize, um, a lot of it was from nine to five, you know, the fact that we would on purpose make sure that people integrated within the group. Again, because, um, you know, we had women, uh, you know, we have had, you know, black women, white women, um, you know, Puerto Rican women, right? Um, we had women of all ages. Uh, and, you know, we made it a point to make sure that people were able to work together and that we put them on projects together so that people could learn from each other. And so someone who had speaking skills would um, work with someone who um, wasn't quite as um, um, verbose, right? And eventually um, it would rub off and that was how we developed leadership. And that's always been important. And, and the fact that we always made sure that there was diversity and that when we had people speaking, yeah, I even, even today, I still find myself, every time I walk into a meeting, I do the diversity count. You know, how many people of color? How many women? Okay, what age group are they? Uh, and, you know, anything else. And I, th I think it's just some ingrained training. And you can't really move society until, unless you're inclusive to everybody. And I think that this movement did a really good job of that. And, you know, in terms of, as, as we've made the film, I remember, uh, I've thought a lot about what can nine to five teach now? And Mary's spoken to some of that, but I'll, I'll mention one other thing, which is, which I think is a real lesson for today. Use humor 
Mm -hmm. You know, shame the boss. Uh, don't necessarily be utterly confrontational, right? And have a litmus test of who can be involved. If you don't agree with me on all these points, you can't be in my movement. I think as, as you say, nine to five was broad and wanted to get people involved because of shared grievances, not keep people away, right? They wanted to bring people together. And I'm sure you didn't ask people if they were Democrats or Republicans. No. They felt about lots of other social issues. They were women who had very clear discrimination against them. They had lower pay. They were asked to do menial, ridiculous things like sew the boss's pants up, you know, clean the dentures. When they're wearing them. <laughs> yes, uh, while they're, yeah, right, exactly. And, you know, get my coffee and just be basically like a waitress. So those were the shared grievances. There was no litmus test about whether you agree on lots of other things. But going back to the humor, because this was one thing that really is wonderful, that unlike the trade union movement of the time, which was very confrontational um, and very male-led, you know, very tough voice and all that, nine to five po people wanted to skewer the boss, wanted to show things that were obvious to the public, like to get public behind them, they, they did that. And in a way, I believe we just, you know, this is a little bit pre-recorded. This is the day of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's funeral as we're speaking. Yes. And it's a huge, it's a profound loss. And I've been doing some more reading about her and I've seen the movie like three times. I'll give an example of how she, when she was arguing before the Supreme Court, like the, the example, she, she used examples that were so obvious to the public, like the Air Force wife, the Air Force woman, who wanted to get um, benefits for her dependent husband, right? And um, he was a dependent husband. And, but they had to sort of say, that, well, look, the same principle should apply to women who are the dependents of their men. And it was undeniable once, you, once she actually pressed for a man to be the dependent, mm -hmm. right? The public got that. So she, you know, her tactics sometimes were a little bit in that same ballpark of let's really make it clear to a broad public, you know, what's the logic here? And what's the logic of treating women as second-class citizens when you really get down to it? Anyway, that was a good thing. Humor. You know, I think one of the greatest yes. lessons of nine to five was about teamwork, about collective action. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I feel like you, Julia, have been making films uh, about for 50 years now is mm -hmm. about how things get done when people organize. When people get mm -hmm. together in groups, whether they're small groups or, or large groups or unions or movements. And the kind of films that we try to make don't have one protagonist. They don't, right. They're not about the heroic individual taking on the boss or the corporation mm -hmm. or, or the government. It's about people getting together. Because if you look at it, it I know Hollywood, of course, has the mythos of the heroic individual, usually a guy. The cowboy. But, but in reality, if the things change when, when communities organize and the films, the documentaries that have inspired us so much over the years are classic films like Eyes on the Prize, which is about a movement, or How to Survive a Plague, about Act Up, you know, another movement. Uh, recently, there's a great film called Crip Camp, uh, which, you know, we, we adore, and that's also about a movement. And it's, it's not one heroic individual who changes the world. It's about groups of people, and we love making films about mm -hmm. groups of people, groups of people. making yeah. change. Yeah. All our films, yeah. So. So I'm, I'm curious, Mary, how the experience of the, watching the film and kind of reliving that time feels felt for you and, and how it feels to see it so condensed into, you know, the 85 minutes of, of the, you know, the amount of time that you spent working in that movement. So um, I saw it twice um, when it first premiered at the American Film Festival. And one time was my son and it was just at, at his wife and it was a complete eye opener for him. And it was, for me, it was a trip through memory lane. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I remember this. And this is what happened here. And th this is the person who I was with when I met my husband. You know, that, you know, that whole, you know, your father, right? That whole thing. And then that evening, I saw it was um, 
a bunch of friends um, were, were dubbed the Asian aunties. And, you know, a bunch of Asian women are about my age. Not all Asian, but um, we call them that anyway, right? Welcome to the club. Julia, like, you could be an Asian auntie, right? Thank you. <laughs> so, so um, and people had no idea because this was such a, a part of my past. And it's like, yes, it was, it formed who I was. And, it, and I grew up during the movement, but I've never really talked about it, you know, partially because it's, not part of our current lives. And it's not that, you know, you forget the past, but just that there's so much going on now and so much that's so important that, you know, what's there to say really? But um, it's really been um, rewarding. And also, um, you know, I, I think when I first left Cleveland working and I, you know, first I moved to Michigan before I moved to California and just all of a sudden being busy seven days a week, um, maybe um, busy 16 hours a day, to all of a sudden not being busy at all. It really, really kind of like left me adrift. And so, you know, eventually I found my way back into um, activism, you know, which was good because that's really where my heart and my home is. I mean, it's, it's more like an avocation. It's not, an, it's not a vocation. Um, so um, it, it's, um, I, I think what it did is it just grounded me to a lot of people. Like, okay, so, so now we understand where, you know, where she's coming from, right? And for me, I was like, oh God, that was just so much fun. And I'm just so grateful to have had this experience and to be able to, you know, see old friends and every so often go to Ohio and see people again. You know, my mother's still in Ohio. So um, in fact, um, I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to see her again. She's 92, but um, I'll be flying out in November. Mary, did your mother get a chance to see the film? You know, one of the most moving parts of the yeah. film is when you talk about how your mother had kept those newspaper clippings of all your activism, even though she was telling you, don't, don't, rough, don't rock the boat and all that stuff. Did she see the movie? So she saw it, but you know, my, my mother doesn't speak um, English and she sort of understands it, but she doesn't speak it. And so she saw the film and it, and it was one of the first drafts, remember? And so oh. she didn't understand anything that was being said but she recognized that I was on the screen a lot. And <laughs> it was, it was like the first draft, I don't know what it was gonna look like, um, you know, a year later, right? But um, she liked it, she was very proud. It changed a lot, right, Mary? This, this film- so I never saw it the first, I never saw it. You saw oh, it? You, you didn't see it. No, no, she saw it, she saw it with my sister. Okay. Oh, she saw yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It changed a lot as we were making it. It really yeah, well, got better yeah. and better and better. Well, we have, we're lucky we have a brilliant editor who was right. tireless and unstoppable. Her name <laughs> Jamie Meyer Schlenk. Uh, Jamie name? years on this film. Because, you know, it's a sprawling story. It it's got 20 amazing women. It takes place in Atlanta, Cleveland, Boston. In Seattle. Oh, all, yeah. all, all across the country. Uh, Cincinnati, uh, you know, different cities. And it's got... 20 years condensed to a feature film. It was a major storytelling challenge. Challenge, right. Mm -hmm. And Jamie did. But you did it. Work. Yeah. And our, really I think yeah. our composer also, who, who really started working toward the end. Uh, yeah, Wendy. Wendy Blackstone uh, also did a great job. And I always have to mention the archival footage because I'm so proud of it. Uh, it took years, years to find that. Uh, it was so surprising to see the archival footage. I mean, I didn't even know it existed. You know, my son said, well, how do I get copies of all this? I said, <laughs> I don't it's, know. It's really hard to find. You know, nine to five, it's one of the great challenges, though, as a filmmaker of making a historical film, whether it was Union mm -hmm. Maze or Seeing Red or this film, nine to five. Um, it's, it's like you're just digging. You're just digging. It's, it's a search. You, you just, it's endless. And whenever you find, like when we found the footage of you, Mary, it's like, oh my God, it's Mary. And she's speaking and there she is. How that was, you know, if you think about it, nine to five was not, was a national movement, but mm -hmm. it isn't like it hit the national nightly news. It hit it a couple times, but mostly it was covered by local television. And you didn't know it was a national movement. I mean, like for, for women like me, this was something that we knew was a wrong that needed to be righted, that needed to be fixed. And so we were just working in the day. We weren't thinking, oh, in two years, we're going to be doing this. And in 10 years, this is going to be that. We just knew that this is wrong and this needs to be fixed. This sucked and it's not going to suck much longer if we keep at it. You know, 
And so we just kept at it. Every little thing and, made a difference. And, you know, when, when we would find the local TV archival footage, it was so exciting. But a lot of that was um, disappearing. It did, yes. It is scary oh. how our visual history is so often just thrown in a dumpster. Mm -hmm. That happened up in Cleveland. One reason, Mary, that we found this beautiful film footage of you as a young activist, mm -hmm. uh, sync sound footage in color of you, at like you're probably 23, 24 yeah. years old, mm -hmm. is that uh, the local TV channel in Cleveland that had, had saved all this material for years, they threw it in a dumpster Wow. And someone, some enterprising person saw that, got a pickup truck, collected boxes of discarded uh, oh, film geez. and video and, 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 yeah. and took it to Case Western Reserve University in, in outside of Cleveland, in Cleveland and gave it to them. And then they preserved it. Eventually. They created right. a, uh, the Northern Ohio, Northeast Ohio Broadcast Archive. They created a whole new archive from this visual treasure that's amazing but it's because someone said hey this matters and guess what if you look in in cincinnati in seattle in boston much there's harder almost nothing yeah almost wow. nothing that it's all thrown away yeah so we were we were lucky with you mary we uh, jane tucker is our, our archival producer she did a great job she spent years finding small and big pieces of footage and photographs from the movement all over the country. Atlanta had actually a fair amount. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. which we found later. So it's, what time, let's see, it's, it was, you all got started in 71, 72. I don't know when you. Um, so actually, um, I think it was like 19, I think it was, for Cleveland, I think it was 1974. Because mm -hmm. I came in at the, that very first year and um, I think that was 1974. Well, it's notable because, of course, it started in, in 1971, and, and then they decided to go national. But yes. When I, I was watching um, Mrs. America, I don't know if you guys know. Yes. On Hulu. Phyllis Shafley. Uh. Yeah. Uh, Kate Blanchett does such a brilliant job. Of oh, she was, she's an amazing actress. But they got the, the, the beginning of the anti-ERA folks with Phyllis Schlafly eventually. I remember that. 1971, 72. That's right. Like the, the Eagle Forum, the real Christian right. Uh, also when, again, Justice Ginsburg was really winning her victories, started in the early 70s, and 9 to 5 started in the early 70s. So through it, it so the, these trajectories are really interesting to follow throughout history. I mean, you see that when, Ronald Reagan became president in 81, it was literally the same month or within a couple months of when nine to five decided to become a union. They decided to become something bigger than an association. It, as somebody says in the film, our timing couldn't have been worse. But you know, you can't predict that sort of thing, right? So in 1981, the, the Reagan took the step as president of firing air traffic controllers. And so the president busted a union, which opened the doors. The president does it. And that's the real rise of the anti-union um, industry, which of course we depict in American Factory, mm -hmm. um, began you know, with the with, at, in the early days, just before Reagan, and really took off after that occurred. So it's interesting that then, of course, the union movement begins to really go into decline. It's an, under attack. The feminist movement um, goes into decline. Nine to five. The whole union part of nine to five was really hampered by the attacks from the anti-union industry. It's it's so interesting. You know, American history comes in waves, right? And we, uh, we're we probably experiencing another one right now, like right now with yeah. the death of Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg and the ridiculous attempt by Republicans to immediately install. I mean, it's terrible, but see, by the time you guys see this, you will know what happened. We don't right now. Maybe, maybe. not by the time, not by the time. We'll still be, we're, we're only in October. 
No. Oh, no, yes. no, but that they do what they say they're going to do, you may know already. Uh -oh. Yeah. 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 We can let that happen, right? So, yeah. Can you guys show us, tell us about your um, your shirts? We can't see them as clearly. Yes. Oh, here, let's stand up. So. Ta-da. Raises, not roses. So Mary Jung discovered the design for these shirts, and she took it upon herself to make a batch of them, and then she shipped them all over the United States to all the other folks in the movie and to the filmmaking team. Yeah. We're so proud to wear these shirts. They're Show really beautiful. Back. Oh, yeah. And Mary, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, yeah. Well, was, you know, originally our grand opening, um, the world premiere was supposed to be at South by Southwest. And so this union shop, Alliance Graphics, I mean, Berkeley, um, made um, the shirts, um, the original shirts. But um, it had the wrong date on, obviously, because the, the premiere had been canceled. And so we didn't want them to go to waste. And so we, um, so we had um, more shirts made. But in the meantime, we took the old ones with the wrong date and um, the cancel date and had face masks made out of them so that um, all the producers and the pe people who worked in the film and the people who were in the film that we could find um, got face masks along with t-shirts. So it had, it had our logo from 1979, which was designed in, at Women Organized for Employment out of San Francisco and the name of the movie on the back. That's so great. So They're reversible, those face masks. <laughs> They're very popular out here. Yeah. Oh, good, good. A lot of wear them. I mean, a lot of people who worked on the film. Good. And, and their daughters. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, it, um, it's great when we pass on our activism um, on to the next generation. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very, uh, the film is very eye-opening to the 30s and 20-somethings now. First of all, because it really makes you aware that how how quickly history can be lost. Mm -hmm. And it also makes you aware of that there's strategy involved in building a movement. There's tactics. You can try something and fail and try again, but you really have to, and I think Mary, you said it really well, um, just bring people together who have just our regular people. They, they don't have to be, um, book educated or have read the stories of, of, of movement strategies. They have to have a shared grievance mm -hmm. and a willingness to work together to, to, to address that grievance. Right. You know what I find so interesting is um, I, work with, you know, I work with a lot of um, young women and men. And what this film has done is, is, is that it's an eye opener. Wait a second, you mean, um, this isn't the, how it is today. Isn't the way it always was. Wait, yeah. what do you mean by you had to make coffee every single day? That um, you had um, there were specific instructions like how many teaspoons of instant coffee, how much cremora, right? And how did you put up with that? And you know, one of the things that I don't think I even said this to you during the interviews was that at one point on one of my secretarial jobs, this is when I joined Cleveland Women Working, I was so incensed over the way that they had treated the executive secretary that I started sabotaging the coffee that every morning when they came in and say like, oh yes would you like your coffee well sure you like it with one package of Sanka well maybe it's going to be one and a half this morning <laughs> eventually they stopped asking that's great. anyway that's great. yes See, that's it sabotage is good I know they never ask within two months they never asked for coffee again. <laughs> a small battle won. I know, I know. But I mean, it was even, an, it was a major eye opener for me. I mean, my first job out of college was in the, you know, the late 80s. I was an administrative secretary, but I knew nothing about, and you know, like, and I would be frustrated if I couldn't like quickly move up, you know, in the organization. It seemed like that was sort of natural progression. And, you know, it was really just, and when I saw the film, you know, 9 to 5, it would like seem like just such an ancient era, even then, you know, in the late eighties to nineteen. It just so it's 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 really it was it was incredibly eye opening, and um, and so I'm just wondering then, particularly Julie and Stephen, like where your what your hopes are for the film as far as maybe helping to catalyze the movement that you know or recatalyze what's happening now, particularly. Well, we're very we're very grateful and proud that the film is going to have two, not one but two, national platforms in Ooh. early 2021. 
we can't say what they are yet, but uh, they are both. Uh, you, everybody, <laughs> everybody knows what they are, uh, uh, and um, except me. Uh, no, no, no. I'm seriously like everybody will will see oh. <laughs> them on one venue or the other, uh, and they'll be available both for free and also um, forever, like for many, many years to come, and, and, and on two platforms that are so accessible. Uh, and why, and that's very exciting. But the the other exciting thing is that the film is also already being used in organizing institutes and and training camps to teach a new generation s some of the wisdom and the tactics and the strategies of of the the nine to five activists. It has been it's been real exciting. Yeah. Limited so far, but once it's it'll be in about February. So by International Women's Day next year, it'll be available all over the country, all over the world. I will say, I take heart, you know, I've been at this for a long time, and the film Union Maids, I'm just gonna mention one film, which came out in 1976, is actually still pretty widely used in training young union members about their mm -hmm. history. And so these, you know, I think these films live on. I believe that. Yeah. And I think the stories of Mary and the other activists uh, are very inspiring to the next generation. And they, to see that just, what did, what did it really take to fight um, sexual harassment? What did it really take to fight for equal pay? What did it really take to stop being called girl? Um, what did it really take? And you guys just lay it out there in the film. You know, along with telling great personal stories, you just lay out how you built that movement. That's why we called it the story of a movement because that's really kind of what we wanted to do with this film. And you know, it's, it's hard, it's, it's sort of, um, these are tough times, right? Obviously, and it's easy to feel disenfranchised when, uh, you know, voters really literally are disenfranchised when, when nearly 3 million people more vote for one presidential candidate and the other person who lost by nearly 3 million votes ends up being president or where your congressional district is so gerrymandered that wow. yeah. there's no chance it can be a competitive race because it's preordained. The, the the representatives pick their voters, not not the way, not the other way around, as it should be. It's easy to feel like just a sense of like the whole the whole game is rigged against working people, against people who believe in fairness and justice and de a decent life for most of us. But the reality is that history is on our side and the numbers are on our side, and it's a question of fighting question of tactics and strategy. And that's where the nine to five women can really teach us. Sticking together, yeah, over the years. That is a fantastic positive message to end on. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for this film, for the work that all of you have been doing for all these years in film and in activism. It's just, it's really inspiring and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mill Valley. Thank, thank you for having us. us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We wish we could be there. I know, we definitely- yeah, I know, there. you're so close, but you're so far. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. Soon, someday soon. <laughs>